My name is uh, Alex Spoto. I am the program director at the Tenderloin Museum. Uh, welcome. How many of you have been here before? A handful. Wonderful. For those of you who haven't, thank you for being here. Uh, I hope you like what you see. Uh, public programming is a major part of what the Tenderloin Museum does, but as you can see from this room, we're also a history museum that provides an overview of the uh, Tenderloin neighborhood's history, very specifically. Uh, we're open Tuesday through Saturday, 10 to 5. Uh, there are resident led walking tours at 1 p.m. on Saturdays. Uh, so come visit us during the daytime, spend a little more time at the exhibit. You'll learn about uh, the, the Tenderloin's roaring uh, early 20th century phase, its vice, uh, its labor history, its uh, history with the queer uh, movement, uh, history with uh, housing solutions, housing challenges, uh, the stories of immigrant and refugees, uh, communities who've made this neighborhood home and <coughs> made it a diverse uh, and colorful, rich place that it is. Um, uh, but like I said, public programming is a major part of we do, what we do. We strive to do one uh, most weeks. This is the final one for 2023, and it's a very exciting one for us. Uh, we've been big fans of Dave Glass and his photography uh, for a long time. Uh, actually, Dave has a photo in the permanent exhibit over there on the wall that he posted uh, today on the gram uh, that is of uh, this this corner uh, during the holidays, happy holidays from the Tenderloin, back when this room was a sizzler. Uh, so <laughs> now I've been in uh, the one museum in the world that used to be a sizzler. Um, Adrian Martinez, Austin Leong uh, run Book and Job Gallery uh, up the street. They have a show uh, that opened a few days ago, but a uh, an opening uh, sort of gathering tonight for a monthly art walk that happens in the neighborhood. First Thursday of the month is when I think the Tenderloin is the, the most alive. So, uh, you know, after the talk, please stroll up the hill, go over to Geary and Lark and check out the many galleries there. Um, and uh, I'm not going to take up a ton of time or space because I believe there's quite a bit uh, to talk about. But uh, we're so grateful uh, to have Dave's work in. Uh, in the museum in a more expanded capacity, uh, and yeah, I'm going to leave it at that because I think you're going to cover everything I could say now, but in a, in a, in a better way uh, during your conversation. So thank you all so much for being here. Uh, I'll let you all take it away. Thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you everyone who came out. I'm going to try not to look at the crowd because that tends to distract me. But I also wanted to thank the Tenderloin Museum for having us and for putting together these programs that are vital for this community. Um, we're really grateful to be here, and yeah. Do you want to meet us off, Austin? Tell us about yourself. Uh, sure. I'll look at the crowd. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, I guess we're doing personal intros. My name is Austin. Um, I grew up in Southern California. I've been in the Bay Area now for going on 11 years. Uh, my father was from here, born and raised, so it was always a home away from home. And uh, yeah. Been photographing for damn near the whole time I've been here, maybe about ten years. Um, there's a lot of similar, I think, similar influences that uh, Dave and I share. Um, actually, that we both share: um, interest, music, photo. Um, given, you know, despite there's probably about a forty-year age difference between us, but uh, yeah, that's. Pretty much me, yeah. As Alex said, we run a space up the street, um, Book and Job. It's a small gallery space that our friend Carson Lancaster started. Um, it's kind of operating as like a project space studio at this point, and yeah, make work as well. Um, yeah. um, I'm Adrian Martinez. I've lived here in San Francisco now for 15 years. Originally, also from Southern California, like Austin. Um, been making photographs for a little less time, but I'd say about the same. I'd say about eight years with a more serious focus. Um, I'm an arts professional here in the city. I help run the space with Austin at the street that we've been talking about, Book and Job Gallery. And Austin and I both run an independent publishing imprint called Little Tom Books that we've been running now for almost six, seven years. Um, we both got to know Dave from making photos, like Austin said, in spite of the 40-year difference. We have a lot of things in common. 
we both love little black and white photos and making them in the most difficult way possible. So I think that kind of was a more formative ground from when we met Dave on the street, shooting around San Francisco. Uh, there were iterations of uh, a collective club of street photographers where we got to know Dave better. And in the last couple of years, we've published uh, two titles with Dave, uh, most recent, which we'll have some copies today, uh, of what called Wash Castle. Um, we're really excited to be able to work with Dave over the years in his archive and, and really just learn from him. Um, yeah, I don't want to take more time away from hearing about the man of the hour. So why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, Dave? Uh, first of all, thank you all for coming. And uh, I want to thank uh, the Tenderloin Museum and their staff and Alex and Katie, the director. Uh, they run a really nice operation here. And you know, if you come back, definitely spend a little time and learn about the uh, history of the Tenderloin. But anyway, I'm a San Francisco native, native of the Western Edition. I grew up a few blocks away from here, maybe 10 blocks from here or so. Uh, and uh, our family uh, eventually left the Western Edition and moved to the Sunset. Uh, and now I live in the Richmond District. And I've been in San Francisco my whole life and have no plans of leaving. But anyway, uh, in terms of the photography, uh, I first my first experience in photography was with a neighbor who lived up the street, Twenty First Avenue, uh, a man named Charlie Bernauer, and he was the photographer for the Examiner, and he used to have a dark room in his in his garage. And when I was about twelve years old, he said, uh, "Come on in here, you can be my helper." And that was the first time I saw a photograph appear in a, in a tray of you know, developer bath, in a, in a, in a developer bath. And uh, it was like magic for me. You know? like, I want to do more of this. <laughs> and you know, it, it, that went to being uh, a part of the high school photography club. And where I would take photos at like football games, and took photos for uh, the high school yearbook and you know, crazy stuff like that. Uh, and then, you know, went to City College. I thought I was gonna be a professional photographer. And uh, I did the whole two year program at City College, took all their courses. This would be 1969, 1970. When they were still located in the uh, in the Cloud Hall building, and that was a fantastic experience for me. Uh, that's where I learned how to develop black and white film in a more precise and professional manner. Learn about the studio lighting, work with view cameras, and work with uh, you know professionals who were training you know young people like myself at the time. Uh, to be a career photographer, which never materialized in my case. <laughs> uh, but anyway, that's my uh, background, and maybe we can start talking about the, uh, you know, the photographs. Yeah, definitely. Um, so we're going to go through a pretty extensive slideshow, just so everyone knows. I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, Dave, we're going to be looking at things in a loose chronologue. They're going to be kind of taken from some of the earlier photographs you've made to more recent times? Yeah, like uh, this is one of my first photos that I took uh, for City College, where we were assigned to do a photographic essay uh, in a kind of a photojournalistic uh, uh, sort of a style. Uh, this is um, Waverly Street in Chinatown. And, and back in those days, you know, this is way before anything resembling the internet of today, uh, people used to read the newspaper uh, that was posted in the window, just like you see here. And there was always a crowd of men reading the Chinese Times. I'd actually never seen this photo before, Dave, so I was pretty 
you're blown away by it. It's really great. One of the many treasures hiding in your, your archive. Uh, this was 1970. Uh, this is a, a composition uh, taken in the South of the Market, also in 1970 during my city college uh, era. And all those buildings that you see there are gone. This was Mission Street, like approximately uh, fifth, fifth edition. And uh, by the way, uh, John Tunney, he was running for senator. His father was the, a professional boxing champion. Mm -hmm. That's a little yeah. trivia there. <laughs> um, this, uh, this photo was taken at a thrift store in the South of Market, also in 1970. This photo, by the way, appears in uh, Washington's, the book that, uh, that Adrian had mentioned earlier. And uh, as you can see, this is the small appliance department, which uh, I've always had a thing about appliances. <laughs> and that's sort of how I ended up being an appliance repairman, I guess. But uh, as you can see, there's a uh, a nice selection of uh, steam irons in case you need one. You can uh, pick and choose any one of those for about five bucks. Um, this is in the Mission District. When I, was a, when I was a student at City College, I was living in the Mission. This is on Cap Street between 18th and 19th. And the, the lady on the top was my landlady. And uh, the woman below is, is just a tenant. And uh, we lived in the cottage. I just had a share a rental. We lived in the cottage in the back. And uh, that building is still there, of course. Chinatown. This, this was, uh, I forgot the name of the school, but there's, it's still there. Um, and it's located on Hang uh, Alley. And what they're doing is they're playing volleyball. And as you can see, the ball is up in the air somewhere. And uh, I didn't wait for the ball to come down, so I just snapped the shot just at this moment. So while we let some of these photos go, Dave, I was wondering if we could talk a little bit about what your experience was like growing up in San Francisco making photos in your hometown and, you know, with, with the upbringing that you had, you know, how you, you know, just connected with, with making art and making photographs in this way, which are clearly, you know, very aligned with, with a vision that I think, you know, you still carry today, or sensibility, I should say, that you still carry today. Well, I recognize right away that San Francisco is a, is a really special and beautiful city. I recognize that from a young age. Uh, and there's just something about San Francisco that's really different than other cities. And just for an example, we have a lot of hills here, right? A lot of big hills. And if you look down the street, that's, the streets don't go around the hills like they do in other cities. They don't follow the contours like other cities. In San Francisco, the streets just go straight up and over, straight up and over. And the houses are all right next to each other. And, and in front of the houses are all those power poles and all those wires. It's like a spider web. And that's a unique look. There's no other city in this country that looks like that. It's, it's you know, that's always fascinating. And that's one of the things I tried to record in my photograph, and I recognized that even back then. Uh, and, and also, all the, the little ethnic enclaves all around the city, the mission, where my family had a mom and pop grocery store. Uh, and, you know, the Sunset, the Richmond, the Tenderloin, Chinatown, North Beach. You know, and, and so even back then, I used to ride around on my bicycle all over the city. Uh, and, uh, and I thought to myself, I ain't going anywhere. Speaking of going somewhere, you did go somewhere for a little bit, right? Uh, I 
I did. And what, what happened was, you know, in 1969, 1970, Vietnam War, and I was draft age. And people from my generation, we had hanging over our head the, the, the threat of uh, conscription. In other words, you know, we go to Vietnam have to, you know, fight the war. And I was very much opposed to that war. Uh, I, was, I was an anti-war activist uh, and uh, demonstrator and, what, you know, troublemaker, whatever you want to call it. Uh, so, and I had a very low um, lottery number. And when my notice came to appear for a physical, uh, to, you know, to qualify for the Army, I knew that it was time to go visit my relatives over in Paris. <laughs> on my father's side, my, my father's side of family uh, settled in Paris after the war. And uh, this photograph here, that's a, um, a subway conductor in Paris. Those old subways, they don't look like that anymore. But uh, luckily, he posed, very low light situation. I was using slow film, so I was lucky to get the shot. Uh, but uh, this was 1971. And how, how long were you in Paris for you? I was only 20 years old. But, but how long were you there for? Uh, I, well, I was in, in uh, Europe altogether for 15 months. But I was in Paris for about six months, and then I traveled around a little bit and with my with my cousin in his car, and then later I moved to the UK. But this is Paris again. This is just the streets of Paris. You can tell by the license plate on that car, the last two numbers, 75, that means Paris. Uh, this is in the Marais district where I was staying. And I can tell you it does not look like this anymore. It's very upscale now, uh, this, this, this section of Paris. Uh, this is in the uh, Montmartre uh, uh, section of Paris. Uh, and you can't see it very well, but in the corner, that's my cousin's car, 1959 Peugeot Cutson 403. And uh, I was able to capture the sign painter and the gentleman leaving the uh, cafe. So by this time, I had moved to the UK. And I, I wasn't in London. I was in northern England. And I lived in Leeds for six months. Uh, and this was in my neighborhood. Uh, you can see where the laundry is hanging. The reason it's hanging in the middle of the street is because these houses were called, what they used to call them, back-to-backs. There were no backyards. So the only place to hang laundry was across the street, just like that. These are some kids in the neighborhood. And, you know, we always talk about photographs that we have taken, and then there's the photographs that we didn't get. And to this day, I, I just wonder because I lost about a dozen rolls of exposed film off the back of my motorcycle that I shot in the UK. And uh, I don't know who found them, <laughs> but I hope they did the right thing. I love that photo. Um, you know, just to go back to it, it feels like such a representation of many of the great uh, British documentary photographs that we've come to know from, from folks like whether it's Chris Killip or David Hearn or other contemporaries. And I just, I saw this and I was just blown away to think, you know, obviously there's the, the loss of those rolls of film, but really, really great image. And I wonder, were you connecting with any folks in that time when you were in Europe? Any other artists or any people in the community? Uh, not in the photography community, although I was aware of uh, British photographer Bill Brandt, B R A N T D, who was also photographing in North England, and this is in Leeds, where I was living. And uh, I knew of his work, but uh, 
this was just how the whole neighborhood looked. And a lot of this neighborhood, like the, like this one, are long gone now. They've been torn down and rebuilt with uh, low-rise, high-rises, you know, affordable housing and whatever. But at the time, you know, these kids were just out there having fun, burning wood, burning wood, burning their homework. I don't know. <laughs> so this is Mission Street between 17th and 18th, and that store there, Lakeside Liquors, was our family business. And me and my sister used to work there, and I made sandwiches, and my dad, he sold uh, liquor, cigarettes, dirty magazines, yeah. uh, whatever, you know. <laughs> and uh, next door, where it says Harris's, that was Harris's Town Pump. It was a bar, and it had a neon sign, and it was like a red water pump with a pump handle like this. And that pump handle would go up and down in neon, and it would fill up a cocktail glass. Exactly. Coolest neon sign. <laughs> so this is Mission District in the 70s. You can see the, uh, the, the old armory back there. And at the time, that was still the armory. And they used to keep uh, you know, military stuff on the ready in case we got attacked by the Japanese again. This is also the Mission District. Uh, this is uh, near the corner of 15th and, and uh, Valencia. And as you can see, uh, people like to shoot their guns even back then. <laughs> so this, uh, this, this is in the Richmond District in front of my house. That's my friend Walter and his uh, 1952 uh, Hudson Hornet. Same car that uh, Jack Kerouac and his friends traveled across the country in, in, the, in his, they described in his book On the Road. I can't help but notice, Dave, you know, I, I feel like you have such a, and you know, we'll talk about other, other neighborhoods in the city a little later, in specific, when we kind of check back to your work here at the TL Museum. But what would you say was the net effect of being, you know, a part of each of those neighborhoods in some ways? They're all so, distinct, but you know, whether it was your family store, and you know, I'm sure we'll talk about the Western Edition, and you know, certainly your time living in Richmond more recently, and in the past, would you say that living or being an active member in those communities influenced what you saw and what you wanted to make pictures of? Oh, for sure. Um, I was, I, you know, it's, I wasn't trying to make art. I was trying to I mean, I was basically making a survey uh, and hoping that it would have some historical significance because my background was not in art. It was more photojournalism and documentary photography. And at the time, I didn't even know, I didn't even know there was such thing as art photography. Uh, back then, Art photography was Ansel Adams. Mm -hmm. Ansel Adams in the 60s and in the 70s, that style was what was in all the books. It was in what, that's what the bookstores carried. Um, you know, uh, Edward Weston, Cole Weston, Imogene Cunningham, you know, the, 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 the California landscape photographers. And, that was kind of what everybody was interested in. I mean, there was like, there was almost no such thing as black and white photography, street photography back then. At some point that changed for you, right? Like at yeah. some point you started thinking about maybe your work in relation to art. And some, I feel like some stories we've talked about with a yeah. legendary little photo, was it seminar? Yeah, well, I'll tell you, you know the one thing that really got me going is when I bought a copy of Robert Frank, I mean, uh, uh, Frank's uh, The Americans. And uh, the, the photos in that book, wow, this is great. I mean, you know, I can take photos like that. I mean, I can develop film, and, and I, I've got a camera, I've got film. I'm in a city that's 
very photogenic. Uh, you know, Robert Frank, I mean, those photographs really had an effect on me. Uh, they were not Ansel Adams. Uh, they were not in imaging cutting in. They were not the California landscapes. They were like urban uh, street photography. And I, I just thought that was a big influence on me. Okay, here, this is uh, the Western Edition near where I grew up. Uh, this is the 1970s, so by this time, I was already living in the Richmond district and uh, was married and had kids. But uh, the Western Edition, which is the neighborhood just adjacent from here, in Tenderloin, um, had a big impact on my life in a number of ways. Uh, I was there to witness the change in the neighborhood from before it was torn down to, until the, the way it is now. Our family, we lived on the corner of Webster and Fulton, which is like right in the heart of Black Fillmore District. And we were renters at the time, and uh, the, the, uh, the city was uh, planning to demolish our building and the whole neighborhood, and you know, my mom and dad decided that we had to pack up and move. So we moved to the Sunset, but my father still had a, had a business on Fillmore Street. He had a, a little coin-operated self-service laundromat at 1121 Fillmore, uh, which is roughly where the uh, McDonald's is now on Fillmore Street, Fillmore and Golden Gate. Um, and it was called? It was just called Wash and Dry. But <laughs> but later he he opened another laundromat next to the grocery our grocery store and he called that one Wash Castle. <laughs> I'm, I'm curious, you know, um, you talk about Robert Frank and that being a big influence. You know, aside from him, like what was big? What was like a motivation for you photographing them? Like were you sh actively showing work at that time? Like how are you getting? the work kind of exposed, or how are you um, sharing it? Well, you know what? I never really considered myself an artist, but I had the good fortune to have, uh, to be able to participate in a group show uh, at a reputable uh, gallery in Paris when I was only 20 years old. And they weren't these photographs, they were California landscapes. <laughs> <laughs> and that's because that's what people wanted to see back then. And so uh, the, the gallery was the American Cultural Center in, in uh, the West Bank in Paris. Have, have any of you ever been there to the American Cultural Center? I think it's still there. But basically it was a theater, a cafe, uh, a library, um, and a gallery. And so, so you wonder, well, how does a 20-year-old kid, you know, who had like almost no money, uh, get, a, get an exhibit in Paris? Well, uh, my cousin had a friend who worked as a, in the American Embassy uh, working for the cultural attaché. And she told them, there's this American kid and he's got some, some of his photographs with him because I, you know, I didn't know I was coming back to the States, so I had some of my portfolio with me. And so I took it over to the embassy in Paris. They looked at it and they said, okay, you know, we'll include you in this group show. It's just three, two other uh, photographers. Put you in this group show. So uh, then I said, yeah, but you know, I just have these small prints and I have my negatives. And they said, okay, we'll, we'll figure out something. So they got me into the dark room at Sorbonne University, which was like, wow, I mean, that's like, I, I couldn't believe it. I didn't really know even what Sorbonne University was <laughs> when I was 20 years old. But you know, for those of you that don't know, that's like, you know, the Stanford or Harvard or Paris. Uh, uh, so I got to use their dark room and I made the prints and, you know, the, the gallery, they framed it and hung them and they did this whole opening and everything. It was, it was a beautiful thing. 
and I, and I was like blown away by that. I was just this kid, and, you know, and I didn't even think the pictures were that good. But people in Paris, they knew who Ansel Adams was, and they wanted to see California landscapes. They wanted <laughs> to see the Ansel Adams style of photography. So I gave them that, and they, they dug it, and that, that was that. But anyway, to answer your question, um, Austin, that was, you know, aside from that, I didn't really show my work anywhere for years and years. And probably the next time I had any public showing of my work was probably in 2010, maybe. So what's that, 50 years later? <laughs> Well, I, I, I love the love being able to continue to discover <coughs> new work from you. I mean, it's you know, it is really just a treat. We've dug into your work so much, and it only continues to just get deeper. So, uh, yeah, I'm 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 happy that you are able to show it and share it. So, uh, in this photograph, uh, this was when I was a appliance repairman which I was for 20 years. Now I'm an old, washed up, former appliance repairman. <laughs> but back then, I used to go to laundromats and motels and uh, dry cleaners, and all I did was I fixed uh, commercial laundry equipment. And this was one of my regular stops. This is Divisadero Street. That gas station's not there anymore. It is in the, in the mid 1970s, and you could see payphone. Uh, see that change machine in the back? That's you put a quarter in to get two dimes and a nickel, because it only cost you know ten cents for the dryer. You could see the sign up on the top. That's how long ago that was. And and that truck parked there. That was my truck. It's a 1971 Dodge uh, Power Wagon. So I may interject and say, just so everyone's aware, we've got a really good amount of photos to see in the slideshow, about 80. So we might pick up the pace with the, the turning of the slides if everyone's okay with that, because we definitely want you to see everything. And Dave, as always, let us know when you want to use on anything, but just wanted to let everyone know so we can see things and not get bummed out when they change faster. Okay, well, hold this one right here. I, I, like, I said, like I said, I was an appliance repairman. There you go. That's there's my tools. Taking a machine apart there, you know, doing a rebuild, and uh, that's kind of what I did all day. When did you decide to start making photos of all that, Dave? Uh, that that's a good question because uh, right around the time that I took that photo, um, the photo of the washing machines, uh, I took a workshop with uh, at um, UC Extension over there on Laguna Street, they're not there anymore, uh, with a photographer named Michelle Ving, it's a V-I-N-G-N-E-S, I don't know if any of you ever heard of her. She's the one who documented the uh, Indian takeover of Alcatraz in 1971. And she was a magnum photographer and she offered this workshop. And, at the, and, and initially I signed up for the workshop just to just to uh, have access to their dark room. Uh, and then, and then uh, when the first workshop began, um, it, was a, it was a workshop on, on uh, documentary photography essays. So uh, it was a 10 week long workshop and I, I, I was really busy because I was like moving and I had young kids and I, and I probably shouldn't have signed up for the class to begin with. And so I went to Michelle and I told her, um, I'm not sure if I can take this course now. I might have to back out. And she said, uh, why is that? I said, I'm just too busy. I don't have time to go out and work on a new project. And she says, well, why don't you just do a documentary set of photographs about your job and what you do at work? And so that's when I started taking pictures of uh, washing machines being taken apart. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm glad you did. Yeah, and by the way, that photo of the washing machine uh, decomposing there, uh, that's in the book, Wash Castle. So there's Lakeside Liquors again, my mom and pop store on Mission Street. 
in the 1980s. Uh, here we are in the Western edition. Uh, this is uh, McAllister. I should note that, you know, um, when I was working as a, uh, as a repairman in my truck, I kept my camera in my truck. I kept the camera in the, uh, in the glove box. It was kind of a junk camera. It was a, a, it was a, a Minolta SLR um, that I still have. And uh, that's how I was, managed to be able to take those photos. You can stop on this one for a second. Another photo I had never seen that you made. And I know I was uh, late to the, the Flickr game where you uh, gained some, some notoriety in our local community. But this is, is an awesome one. Well, 1980s, right? Look at the hairstyle. Oh, yeah. <laughs> this is uh, where Moscone Center is now. And at the time, Moscone Center was like half built. And then the half that was built was the Democratic National Convention in 1984. And this was outside of the convention. And the reason these folks showed up is because there was a free concert outside of the convention of the dead communities. So I, I think about you wandering around in these neighborhoods during such formative times in San Francisco. Did you ever run into other photographers out there? I think of, of you know some of your peers that are around the same age, you know, Michael, Janet, so many other folks are thinking, you know, here's in Moscone and thinking of Janet Delaney's work. Did you ever bump into anybody making photos in the city? Never bumped into Janet Delaney, never bumped into Michael J. You know, it just seemed like there was about a half a dozen street photographers in the city and they all knew each other, except for me. <laughs> the, only, the only street photographers that I knew um, was uh, Jerry Stoll, who wrote the book, uh, 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 I forgot the name of it, but I Am a Lover. He wrote a book called I Am a Lover, Photographs of San Francisco in the 50s. And he was kind of like my mentor at the time. Um, and uh, Ira Nowitzki, I met him a couple of times as well. I'm, I'm curious, did you find working, because I know you talked about like you would service laundry machines and other than your own. Um, did you find that that would kind of bring you throughout the, the city and kind of allow you to kind of stumble upon different situations? Absolutely. I mean, you know, I, I had to travel all through the mission. Western Edition, the Tenderloin. I mean, you know, you, you gotta go through the Tenderloin to get to about just about anywhere, because it's right in the middle of the city. So, you know, I would have a repair job in the Mission, and then I'd go to like, uh, you know, uh, Hyde and Ellis, and then I would go to uh, uh, to uh, Bush and Stockton, and then I would, you know, I had like a route that I, that I did, and I'd, I'd go to like 15 locations a day. Uh, all over the city, the Excelsior, the Richmond, Sunset, all over. And since I had the, you know a loaded camera in my truck, you know, you know, hopefully I just uh, you know had the wherewithal to you know wash my hands, pull the camera out, you know, I always have to use hands, pull the camera out, and uh, take a couple of snaps. This one is in uh, Los Angeles. You know, my sister moved to Los Angeles in the 80s. So I made a lot of trips down there when I had visits. And uh, I don't know if any of you recognize Angeline, the, the board queen. That's her. I used to see her driving around in LA when I was a kid in that pink Corvette. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I she was still doing it. Pink Corvette, pink uh, mini skirt, pink everything. Thing. Yeah. <laughs> um, just really quickly, just to kind of anchor us in the space too, would you say most of the photos that are just on view in the other room, were those taken kind of in your comings and goings on your roots? Yeah. Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, some, you know, most of them. And, and then there was also a lot of times where I'd just be hanging out with friends and visiting with friends. And, you know, I kept, I kept, I mean, like, Look, look how many guys here, they have a camera with them right now. I didn't exactly do that, but I had a camera with me most of the time. I've got a camera with me right now. Young as every day. So, okay. 
1986, I traveled to Hong Kong and took a few photos there. I, I went to Hong Kong and I went to Myanmar, uh, Burma at the time. And this is an old neighborhood in Hong Kong. There's a lot going on here, as you can see. Um, and I like this photo because it's just, it's got like three or four different areas of the photograph that has different things going on. And I kind of like this, this, these kind of scenes. Hong Kong again. Uh, another new one for me that Austin and I were just stoked on at the time when we were putting this together. Yeah, and uh, this is the 1980s, and, and uh, I was shooting with my first um, small compact camera. It was a, a Olympus XA, so it's not autofocus, but it had auto uh, exposure. And uh, it just is, I don't know if you're all familiar with those cameras, but it was one of the first cameras that was like tiny, tiny little camera. I mean, it was about the size of a pack of cigarettes. It, it was like pre-point-and-shoot automatics. It had a great lens, too. This was taken with the same camera. Uh, you, you ended up doing a whole body of work in Burma, too. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. We'll see. These <coughs> Burma photos. Okay, this is in Burma. Um, I think they start smoking a little too young <laughs> in that country. <laughs> uh, this was a family that uh, that uh, posed, sort of posed for me uh, in Rangoon, which is now called Yangon in uh, my Myanmar. As you can see, you can see how they bathed. It's just a pot of water there. What brought you to Burma um, and to Hong Kong at that time? Well, I was traveling with a friend, uh, and uh, he had not been there, I had not been there, uh, but we just felt like traveling. Uh, he was not a photographer, I was, but he was into, he was very much into music, collecting mu musical instruments, records, and so on, and so, that, that kind of motivated him. I was into taking photographs. So uh, uh, that between the two of us, we covered a lot of ground and we were there for about five weeks. Uh, this, is, this is along the train tracks in northern uh, Myanmar, near Chiang Mai. No, excuse me, near um, Mandalay. And that's the cover of a, of a small title that you put out with, with our buddy Chris, right? Burma Bound. Burma Bound, that's right. This was the cover photo. Did this lead to more trips, or was that just a single trip? Uh, I, just, I just did this one trip, and then I went back to Hong Kong one more time, but I didn't go back to, to uh, Myanmar. Now, at the time, okay, this is in Mandalay, this scene right here. At the time, uh, 19, this was 1987, it was just before the de democracy revolution. If I would have stayed there uh, another couple of months, I would have been in a conflict zone. Uh, but at the time, uh, they allowed uh, Westerners only a seven day visa. So I couldn't stay there very long, but in the seven days that I was there, I was able to snap uh, you know, a few good rolls of film. I feel like growing up in a city that changed so often and so frequently, like San Francisco, and, and just kind of, you know, the sensibility you develop for yourself about how you make photos, do you feel like that drew you to some areas that I can think of right now, but also areas of rapid change, whether, you know, through conflict or otherwise, like Burma, Hong Kong, you know, Western Europe, and so on? Yeah, it, it, it did. I mean, I went there, but, it, you know, with uh, taking photographs in mind, but um, to document, to document, right? But later, when I got to know Michelle Bing, she sort of taught me something different. She said, "Forget about traveling and taking photographs." She says, "People want to see pictures 
of where you're from. They want to see pictures of San Francisco. They want to see pictures of the Bay Area. You know, everybody can go and travel, take travel photographs, and, and if you're not careful, they just end up looking like travel log. But if you take pictures of your of your home environment, so people from other countries or from other parts of the United States can see what San Francisco looks like from a native's perspective. So I, I didn't travel anymore after that. I stuck to my roots and just photographed here in San Francisco. I find that fascinating that here, you know, the neighborhood I feel like you identify with so much the Western edition is one of just such a rapid or just dramatic uh, visual kind of change. You know, it, it's it's amazing how much it changed. I mean, the first part of the Western edition to change was the Japantown area. And uh, that was like what they call uh, phase 1A. And we lived in phase two, uh, which which is the section south of Gary Street, where they just started demolishing all the houses, and including the house that we lived in. And the house that we lived in on Webster Street, okay, you know where Webster Street is, is, is uh, two lanes and then it turns into four lanes? Well, the reason it, it, it ended up being four lanes is they tore down all the houses on one side, including ours, so they could create this like grand boulevard that never really materialized. Uh, and uh, uh, and uh, after that, I came back to the Western Edition many times for my service calls, and you know I watched the houses getting moved, and you saw the photos of the house moved, houses being moved. Uh, I saw houses getting torn down, uh, and I saw empty lots just sitting there for years and years. And um, yeah, it was a very moving experience, very sad experience to see that happening. This is this shot here is in Oakland. I do photograph outside of San Francisco, <laughs> so this is, this is over in Oakland uh, near. I like near Lake Merritt. You know, the square format this time, too. Mm -hmm. Mixing it up. Yeah, square format. So it, this is here in San Francisco. That's not the real divine. <laughs> it's a divine impersonator. And uh, as you can see, every once in a while, I take some risks and, uh, and hang out in different sorts of uh, establishments. I'm curious about that because you know, as a photographer, you always kind of face those challenges. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm wondering if you could talk about that. Like, did you ever get pushed back in different situations, especially maybe communities or uh, yeah, that were outside of your, your what? Yeah, absolutely. But in this case, okay, this is the 1980s. Okay, so this late 1980s. So what did we have in the late 1980s in terms of camera gear? We had those like those point-and-shoot autofocus little cameras that uh, everybody started using in the 90s, but they appeared in the 1980s. And uh, so, and they pretty much flash every time you took a shot, even if you didn't want them to flash. <laughs> and so when you go into an establishment like this and take a flash photo, people are kind of used to it, you know? They're used to having a flash photo taken because everything, you know, Everybody had one of these little point shoot cameras, and that's what I used here. I used a little Yoshika T4 to take the shot. Um, and people didn't mind a flash camera. Like now, you go to a bar with a flash, it's like, whoa. You know, people are just not used to it anymore. This is you know, just on the streets of Chinatown. I took a lot of photos in Chinatown. Uh, I had friends who lived there. <clears throat> and then after I moved from the Richmond district to, to uh, North Beach, Russian Hill area. So uh, I was in Chinatown a lot. What brought you there? To Chinatown? Yeah, like what, how did you make that move out in that direction? What was the, the circumstance? Uh, like, interesting. Right? Earthquake. Exactly. The 1989 earthquake. The house that I lived in had a, had a bunch of damage. The house got sold, moved to an apartment on Francisco Street, 
and uh, I lived there for 23 years. I love how these kind of momentous parts of SF history have quite literally influenced you and, and you know, moved you or your family around, you know, whether it's the establishment of the Western edition the way we know it today or this, this iconic earthquake. Um, it's just, it feels so, so San Francisco. Yeah, how many of you were here for the 89 earthquake? <laughs> that was a good one, huh? Oh, yeah. That was a good one. Under the Embarcadero Freeway in front of the ferry building. Oh, yeah, yeah. Candlestick Park. <laughs> Ocean Beach, I was lucky. I saw the sand ripple. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah, that would have been cool to see. <laughs> I like this photo. This was at a New Year's Eve party at um, Eli's Mile High Club in Oakland in the late 80s. Sounds like we got some fans in the building. Eli's Mile High Club, anybody know? Yes. Yes. <laughs> but this was back in the days when it was an old fashioned blues club. And I think it's really different now. <laughs> this is another favorite for sure. I know I keep pointing that out because I just nerd out as much as anyone on your work, but this is a, such a cool photo. I've never seen it. Mm -hmm. Candlestick Park. Uh, I can't remember exactly what happened. It was a home run, I believe. <laughs> uh, and, and it was, uh, you could see everybody's on short sleeves. It was like a warm night in September. And it was during the playoffs in 1989. So this photograph was taken probably a week or a week or ten days before the uh, the 89 earthquake. Mission District. You can tell by the hairstyles. <laughs> um, this one was in the uh, parking lot. At, uh, at the Oakland Coliseum in the early 80s. Um, a woman who uh, I knew who was a writer for Sunset Magazine asked me to take these photos. It was, uh, and she paid me, so it's one of the rare times I got paid to take pictures. Uh, she was writing an article about uh, tailgate cuisine and cooking. And it was in Sunset Magazine and had like, it had this picture in there, but it was mostly just recipes and stuff. <laughs> I don't know if anybody paid attention to the pictures or not. Uh, this is uh, Hate Street, Hate Masonic, during one of the Hate Street fairs. And here we are back in the Western edition again, the, the, uh, during the Gulf War. <laughs> Still tracks. Yeah. Uh, a, a man in the straight jacket there. He gave me a good one. And it, it, what I love about this photo is look at the kids. <laughs> They're looking at this guy like, are you crazy? What are you doing in a straight jacket? But this was at the Hate Street Fair. Okay, I went to visit some friends in Chicago. So I did travel a little bit. Uh, but uh, I went to a Cubs game. But I was early, so I had a had a beer over at the um, at the uh, Cubby Bear across the street from Wrigley Field. There's an interesting story about this photo. I got to tell you this one. That was my mom's car. It's a 1975 uh, Olds Cutlass, and my mom gave the car to my sister, and my sister gave the car to this man named Guillermo. And he did some like gardening and stuff at my sister's house. And uh, so my sister gave him the cars, you know, because uh, my sister got a new car. So Guillermo, he was an immigrant from El Salvador, and that's his wife in the background. This is East LA. And he's fixing his brakes. But here's the story. Um, he hid his money, his cash money, because they, you know, he's an immigrant and didn't uh, have access to banking. And, so that sort of stuff. So he hid his money in the trunk of his car in a paper bag under the spare tire. Okay? Then the car got stolen and he lost all of his money. So, like a month later, the car was recovered and his money was still there under the spare tire. So he did not lose his. 
Do not lose his own. A rare win, for sure. He earned, lucky he earned. Uh, I have a friend in Reno that I go visit, so I actually took this shot in downtown Reno, uh, late 1990s. There's my laundromat. Does, do any of you remember that place, Little Hollywood? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I was, I was the owner. And I, and I also worked there. And I'll tell you what, I did, the, I did the repairs, but I also did the laundry. Everybody's laundry. I folded, washed and folded more socks and underwear than I, everybody I know put together in that place. That place was such a, a special spot, I feel like, in the, in the community and on that block. I mean, certainly we, we touch on that in that book that we made, but what do you think made it so unique um, as a, beyond the place to do your laundry? Uh, a couple of things. Well, first of all, uh, an artist um, named uh, Neil Levine uh, painted murals all through all of the three inside walls. Um, and uh, it had a fabulous like Art Deco storefront. And if you drove by uh, at nighttime, the place was beautifully lit up. It had a real nice neon sign. And it was just like, phew, it looked really cool. So it really attracted a lot of people to come. That's the inside. You can see the murals right there. You can see there's the Castro Theater mural in the background. That's uh, really one of my customers. You think that that mural and everything in the in the space is why Del the Funky Homo Sapien wanted to film a music video? Like that? <laughs> I think so. Yeah, that's right. Well, some trivia. Del the hum Del the Funky Homo Sapien. Anybody know who that is? <laughs> you can feel us. <laughs> So, so um, he shot an MTV video inside my laundromat in 1993. He was just a kid at the time. And uh, it was a video that was used as the closing credits of a really terrible movie called Made in America. So I don't think anybody saw it because they probably left the theater before the movie was over. <laughs> Ted Danson was in it. The movie movie. Uh, this was during the uh, Grand Prix of San Francisco, a bicycle race. Uh, that was like in 2001, I think, or 2001, 2002. Um, and uh, it, it attracted like, you know, some of the really good professional bike racers. But uh, two years later, the, um, the neighbors complained and the, the, uh, the event never came back. Here's a photo that's not in the show, but maybe could have been. Yeah, it could have been. I mean, this is the tenderloin right here. Uh, this is on the, the corner of our space, actually. So uh, I walked by this spot many years later a lot. But, uh, the gangway. The gangway on the on uh, Larkin and Gary. Oh, yeah. Now it's called a Kung Fu Lounge. <laughs> Kung Fu Lounge. Okay, fast forward here. This is we fast forward all the way to like 2017. So I got to give you a little background. Um, between like 20, I mean 2000 maybe in, in seven and 2017, I was shooting with a digital camera, not film. I was shooting film too, but I was shooting a lot with a digital camera because I thought, wow, this is this is great. These take really good color pictures, and I never shot color. So uh, you know now I can do some some color work, uh, but I never really felt like it was like my medium. So I went back to black and white, and and these are all like since nineteen since twenty seventeen black and white photos, black and white film photos. Did you find it hard in that time to be shooting color? When you look back, like do you feel like I mean feels obvious that this is your medium in a specific way, you know, just the sensibility of how you compose things in black and white. You know, I, I've always felt that black and white was my medium, and, and color film, I tried a, a color film a couple of times, and I just couldn't control the colors on me, you know, I mean, I, I had to rely on the color lab, and, and the color lab didn't get the colors right half the time, 
color film, also the old coat of color color films, they, they decomposed and faded and turned orange or anything. Um, this was at the screening of, um, of the Jim Marshall documentary film, I forgot what it was called, of Show Me the Picture. The Jim Marshall, uh, and you know, Jim Marshall took this famous photo um, of uh, Johnny Cash you know, with, the, with the middle finger. And so uh, when the, the, the uh, filmmaker uh, brought up that photo, this is what the audience did. <laughs> Uh, something I'm curious about is your work has been so consistent since the beginning, like it's, and it seemed to not miss a beat. Like every year, it seems like you have work from that year. Um, you know, as a photographer, I feel like there's always ruts. Did you ever find yourself in ruts? Or, yeah. And if, if so, like how did you get out of it? Well, I kind of got into a rut uh, shooting with a digital camera. <laughs> <laughs> it was like. It was like too easy, you know, and, and like you didn't have to compose anymore. You could just like, and it was all, I almost felt like I was cheating. Uh, I wasn't. Almost felt like I was cheating. Although, you know, that being said, I really respect digital photography, and there's some beautiful work out there, and I've taken some good pictures with a digital camera, okay? But I always felt that film in black and white was like my medium. So like during that digital time, yeah, I kind of went into a rut. I didn't do any darker work. I didn't, you know, I, I just was in front of a computer all the time. And, and I thought, yeah, I think I'll go back to the film. And, and meanwhile, um, it, we're talking like 2013, 14, 15, you know, so many people gave up film at that point. There was like an ocean of film cameras out there, and they were cheap. They're not cheap anymore. <laughs> but, but they were cheap then. And, and like you could buy a Nikon single lens reflex, a pro Nikon, like an F2. Buy an F2 with a lens for a hundred bucks. You know, it's okay. a cheap thing. This is uh, in my neighborhood, out by Ocean Beach. Now we're getting to a few of the last photos of the slideshow, and we'll have to make some time for some questions. Um, I can sit here and listen to you talk for hours, but wanted to know, how, like before we wrap up, how did this project in the Tenderloin Museum come about? And, you know, maybe to, to reground us again here and, and let us know about any thoughts you have on the neighborhood, certainly. Okay, well, um, a couple of years ago, uh, when you did the, uh, the Blue Lamp Remember project, Alex contacted me. Uh, Alex uh, and Katie were putting together a, like a little documentary about the Blue Lamp Bar. Do any, anybody remember the Blue Lamp? Okay. Well, if you like the Blue Lamp, you've got to see the film. It's on YouTube still, right? It's on YouTube. Film is generous. Uh, Zoom conversation. <laughs> yeah, it's on YouTube. It's on, yeah. But it was done in the thick of the, of the pandemic when everybody was on Zoom in person, and uh, you know, LeVay Smith was part of it, and, and LeVay Smith and her husband, uh, what's her husband's name? Chris, Chris, Chris Siebert. Chris Siebert. They, did, they did a gig like in their apartment, you know, as part of, the, part of this, and, and uh, the author um, who did uh, The Hard Crowd, Rachel Kushner, was, was part of it, and, and, um, uh, and Pierre, uh, uh, Mr. Lucky was part of it. And anyway, it was really good. And I had a bunch of photos that I had taken in the 80s, late 80s and early 90s at the Blue Lamp. And uh, Alex saw them online. And so he contacted me to uh, participate in, by, um, you know, uh, by uh, letting him use uh, my photos in that film. It's a really a cool film. You should watch it. And so uh, a couple of years later, Alex contacted me again. And, asked me if I want to uh, uh, hang some photos in here at the uh, Tenderloin Museum, and I said, sure. So this is, this is, you know, in my neighborhood. I'm out by Ocean Beach, by the way. Uh, this is in my neighborhood, and in case any of you don't know, every um, third Sunday morning, all these old car enthusiasts all show up 
with their old cars, a few low riders, a, you know, whatever. And uh, they all gather there and hang out, and it's uh, a real fun time. And if you're into car culture, come out and check it out. I'm sensing a theme too. Our first book that we did together, Automobile as Landscape, was your your idea for many years that you wanted to make into a book. And you know, we helped you realize that vision and certainly can pick up on all your interest here with cars, but you know, maybe you can expand on that. You sound like a, a car guy. Yeah, I'm I'm definitely a car guy. Uh, I, I used to work on you know, I was an appliance repairman, so I was a car repairman too, but not a professional. I just worked on my old truck. <laughs> Pretty much, I had a '53 Chevy pickup back back then, you know, the early days, and then that old Dodge. And uh, so I was, you know, I had greasy hands a lot of a lot of the time. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I did cars, and but I also really like car culture, you know, like low, low rider culture. So uh, you know, I've always photographed that. This is uh, this photograph was just taken uh, this year. This is out at, uh, out at the Embarcadero. And uh, these guys, they were pissed off about one of their leaders being assassinated in Canada. So they all showed up. This, this is the, uh, the Sikh community. Uh, and you know they're seeking a homeland. The Sikhs are seeking a homeland. <laughs> Khalistan, as you can see there. And so they all showed up in front of the India, um, the Indian the consulate on Arguello. on Arguello, and they were loud and pissed off. And you could hear them from our place. Yeah, yeah not, so, not necessarily very close. Yeah, I know, not that close. That's right. And, and how? Because you're still doing uh, laundry machine repair once a week, all right? Yeah, twice a month. Twice a month. Yeah. Sorry. I, so you're still getting around. I still do it. I have a route where I go to four different apartment buildings. No longer that's anymore. Four apartment buildings. I, you know, do some repairs, uh, collect the money, deposit the money in the bank with the owner. Go take some pictures. Take a few pictures. <laughs> yeah. <right away. laughs> I don't have a truck anymore though. What are you riding now? I've got a motor scooter. <laughs> This is a scene out in the Sunset District. This is uh, on Judah and 20th Avenue. Just some folks. Oh, and, uh, and here's, you've, have any of you guys seen this guy? Oh, yeah. He's there since the eight, from the 80s all the way into the... He's like the, the, our local kid hater. <laughs> he, he, he hates kids and he goes around with all these signs. I'm oh, sorry, I confused it with the stop having sex guy. <laughs> that guy does. That guy may not be around anymore, the stop having sex oh, guy. Oh, yeah, I, I know you're talking about. Yeah. So no, this, this guy is the kid hater. And, and as you can see, he's serious about not having kids. <laughs> so that's the. Okay. I'm, I'm just wondering, like, you know, what does his girlfriend think about? I've always wondered what his like what his parents think about. <laughs> I've always wanted to ask him, so how are you born? Fall down? Like, <laughs> so that's our last photo and the perfect segue, maybe, to some questions. Um, thank you for bearing with us. I know we started a little later. Certainly spent a little bit of time, but um, there's a lot to see. So thank you all. <laughs> So uh, if anybody wants to ask any questions, you know, if you want to ask any nerdy uh, gear questions or photo questions or anything. Yeah, we'll take a few with the mic and then certainly we'll be hanging out after. But Alex, go for it. Anybody? No question, just passing the mic. Hi. Uh, Hi. My name's Andrea. Hi, Andrea. Um, so uh, I know you have a Flickr account where you post things, but I'm just curious, uh, like over the years, how do you review and like revi refine? Do you print everything out? Do you ever, did you? Oh, well, that's a good question. Like stop along the way? That's a good question. Um, I guess you could say I had the proverbial uh, shoe boxes full of negatives for years and years and years, you know, like so many other people. And, uh, you know, it's like, what do you do with them? 
So uh, when, when the technology uh, um, appeared where I could uh, digitize them and scan them or print them, uh, I got I got myself a scanner and a printer, and uh, you know spent a lot of time on that. And then when the pandemic arrived, I had lots of free time, so I spent like many 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 hours just like organizing and digitizing my archive. Um, and uh, but before that, it was pretty disorganized. If, I, if I'm not mistaken, Dave, you said that. Uh you scan almost your entire archive during the pandemic? Yeah. <laughs> What's the count there? Uh, I'm, I'm up to about uh, 10,000 images. It's not bad for greasy hands. Yeah. These are just black and white film images, and they're not everything, it's just all cherry picked. Do, do, do you think projects, too? Sorry. Do you think projects like, you know? Uh, automobiles, landscape that we did, or the uh, Wash Castle kind of helped you dive deeper into, into the work? Absolutely, because it um, it forced me to get organized. And uh, it forced me to uh, pay more attention, keep the negatives clean, you know, make, make proof sheets, uh, you know, keywords, all that kind of stuff. Absolutely. I'm glad to be the field of the fire. <laughs> My motivators. <laughs> How do you do it? Anybody else? Hi, I'm Darwin. You greet me. I just realized watching you at the slideshow that I have one of your photographs framed in my living room. The one of, I, I think it's at the Scud with the vine. Was yeah. That, yeah, I have. I bought it at some event that you were at <clears throat> South Market, and they had pasted your photos up on a brick wall. Yeah, the gas is parking lot. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. So I got it there. So it's like, oh my god, I didn't even realize that was you. So thank you. Oh, thanks, thanks. Well, you know, I'm glad that you brought up that parking lot <coughs> show because you know I wanted to put a shout out to uh, Troy Holden. You all know Troy Holden. Um, Troy kind of introduced me to the photo community that I was sort of not part of yet. Um, and uh, he invited me to participate in that parking lot show. Um, and through that parking lot show, I met Michael Jane, uh, and uh, and uh, I met uh, Ted Pajinski, and, and a bunch of other good photographers who participated back then. Um, and um, and then you know later, um, I, I, you know I thought, oh, Michael Jane's having a um, is having a, uh, an, op an open studios at his house over in the Richmond district. So I went over there and that's where I met um, Adrian for the first time. And you know, we connected right away and that's kind of how all this came to be. Yeah, I think it goes without saying that, you know, and thank you all again for coming. The show of community and folks kind of being around and giving each other an opportunity as a, as a transplant myself in the city, I've certainly uh, been the beneficiary that generosity and that kind of spirit within our arts community. So um, again, like everyone who shows up here tonight, it means so much. Um, it's great to celebrate Dave and celebrate each other. It's great to celebrate the space and the Tenderloin Museum. Um, but yeah, needless to say, it, it's funny, like in hindsight, it all seems choreographed, but it really just begins with one gesture and kind of keeps going. And I know there's lots of people in this room who do that regularly, so just shouting them out as well. Yeah, thanks, Adrian. Uh, any other questions? <clears throat> oh, hey, Ray. Now that those are all the rage I hear again. Yeah. I know. 
I know. That's what I'm hearing. I think I got. A, I think I got a. You gotta dig it up. Floating in my, one of my drawers at home, floating around there somewhere. Yeah, get, get some good money for that, Nate. <laughs> yes. to start off with is, you know, go look at some books of, of the really great artists who do the kind of art that you like to do mm. and look for inspiration from them. Uh, go to the SF MoMA and get some inspiration there. Um, and and uh, just, you know, invest in some good art supplies and just do it. And, and uh, you know, try to improve your skills, and you know, I mean, they'll they'll naturally improve as as you do it. But but uh, it, it's the inspiration that uh, will motivate you. I'm gonna add on that too. Just mm -hmm. something that Dave, I feel like, was such a, a big inspiration for us is that you know we've always held down day jobs too, you know, mm -hmm. you know, finding the struggle of making work and staying, you know, hungry. It's interesting to hear you talk about that. It's like working with what you have. So like you made a whole series that we saw early on that were like, that's awesome. You know, like that. And uh, kind of trying to like utilize that in my own daily routines. It's just kind of whether I'm on the way to work or at work and you know, taking a little longer lunch to get back to work. Um, <laughs> is kind of just trying to stay interested. And engage in making, yeah. Like, like Dave was saying, we're thinking about art. I think many times when you were making those pictures, but you know, in hindsight, that's that's certainly what I see. Maybe maybe a few of us feel the same. Uh, I just want to shout out for uh, Austin. Uh, he's got a, a, a set of photographs at, at Pier Twenty Four. Really, some good stuff. He's got a whole room of his work there. And, uh, and, it's, and uh, the show is coming down in about 10 days or so. That's right. So if you want to go see it one more time, if you haven't seen it already, go check it out. Because Pier 24 is free. And it's just a, you know, it's a beautiful institution. It's not going to be there a lot longer. So uh, go check out um, you know, Austin's uh, photographs. I mean, you know, there's a couple of photos there by uh, Henry Wessel, who's, I would say, is kind of your mentor. But not in this show, but uh, they're, they're within the collection of Christian Forum. Right, but you can definitely tell <laughs> the the uh, influence that uh, Henry Wessel has had on, on Austin because uh, there's some similarities there, and mm -hmm. I'm saying that in a good way. Appreciate you, Dave. We do have time for one more question before we wrap this up. There's one in the back over there. Or, uh, wait. <laughs> Just yell. Yeah. Me? Okay. Yeah. I, was I can hear you. I was interested in your, uh, do you stick to the same stock and developer? Do you develop your own stuff? I do. I develop, my, I develop all my own films. Uh, well, first of all, um, I'll, well, I'll tell you what I use. I use uh, T-Max 100 Kodak and 400 Kodak, and my developer is, uh, is uh, um, Ilford ID11 uh, for 10 and a half minutes, a, a one, to, one to one. Uh, but, you know, that being said, you know, there's a lot of films out there, there's a lot of developers out there, there's a lot of technique out there, and, like, you can go on and on and on with, like, endless experimentation 
and, and, uh, and failures. Uh, and it could be really frustrating. So what I would suggest is, you know, find a film and developer combination that you like, that works, and just stick with it. So you don't have to think about that part of your process anymore. Solid advice. So maybe with that, um, we'll close this out. We'll be hanging out for a while. Again, plugging the TL First Thursdays, if you're hanging out in the neighborhood, seeing any of the other spaces and our neighbors here. Uh, thank you again to the TL Museum. Thank you to Austin. Thank you to Dave. And thank you so much to everybody who came out to support. We really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you everybody.